Right, hello everyone, and uh, a warm welcome to today's lunchtime seminar uh, brought to you by the UCL Centre for Ethics and Law. So the UCL Centre for Ethics and Law is keenly interested in broad issues of law, ethics, governance, regulation, and today we are very, very pleased to have with us Professor David Ravasi of the UCL School of Management to come and share with us insights on organizational change uh, and the impact of uh, technology. Uh, we, are, we find this event to be a very special one and we are very glad that David is with us today because we really would like to construct um, interdisciplinary discourse um, and uh, introduce insights from other fields beyond the law to our legal colleagues uh, and students. So um, after David speaks, uh, we have as our discussant, our faculty um, expert in law and technology, uh, Dr. Michael Veal is lecturer in digital rights and regulation. Uh, and Michael will speak to us about uh, data structures, organizational structures, and broadly his thoughts on uh, David's talk and law and technology. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor to David, who will tell us a bit about this interesting background he has, uh, as well as uh, to give us the talk. Thank you. Over to you, David. Thank you, Iris. No, it's just, uh, just you can see this is a uh, Godzilla against a great wave, hook size great wave. And, and uh, the reason why I'm having this background is because I was not allowed technically, this is a new technology getting in the way of uploading my uh my official ucl background so this is something that i found in my own virtual background and uh, we thought it would be an interesting way to remind us about the unexpected uh, outcomes of technology you, know, you remember godzilla was the result of a nuclear experiment gone bad. but anyway so uh let me open my own set of slides so that with no further ado uh, we move on to the topic of the day, which is uh, organizational uh, culture and new technology. Well, if you're uh, hoping that I will tell you about how new technologies are changing organizational cultures around the world, you're going to be disappointed because I don't know. I mean, and, and when I know, I say, like, I haven't seen any systematic, reliable, large scale research that allows us to answer such a broad question. We have a lot of, we, we know something about, we have some interesting anecdotal insights, but especially because uh, answering this, this uh, question is difficult because it's such a broad question. And at, at the very least, we should recognize that when we talk about new technologies that are changing the workplace, there are different types of technologies. Uh, usually we tend to think of new technologies as technologies of information processing, like um, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, technologies that enable us to, uh, uh, to collect, store, retrieve, elaborate information at a, a speed and a scale that are absolutely unprecedented. Uh, but there are also technologies of remote interaction that are developing rapidly. Uh, software that is allowing us to perform remotely uh, what we used to perform, what we used to do face to face. And these technologies have been obviously spurred by the uh, by the pandemics and by millions and million people moving to to smart work into remote work. Technologies of internal communication. An increasing number of companies are trying to replicate inside 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 their boundaries uh, the functioning of uh, social media of internal. Uh, social networks or enterprise social networks are they called uh, replacing more traditional ways of communicating to and among employees and finally and and scarily in some ways uh, technologies of workplace surveillance are also uh, developing rapidly uh, again also as a response to the increased uh, reliance on smart working and i must confess that when i've seen the the developments of what they refer to as employee monitoring software, uh, I'm disturbed, personally a little disturbed. And, and, and this is probably a reflection of, of my own occupational culture. As, a, as an academic professor, I'm used to value my privacy and my autonomy and the idea that uh, my employer is tracking my screen activity on or the amount of time I spend at my desk. Uh, that for me is an absolutely intolerable intrusion into my privacy. But I recognize that there are many companies out there that find this absolutely acceptable. 
uh, or indeed um, desirable. Uh, and, and this is a reflection of how different cultures, occupational or corporate cultures, may, uh, may respond to particular development of technology. Now, we may not know exactly how new technologies are changing, or all these new technologies are changing organizational culture, and indeed whether they are changing them at all. But what we do know is that whenever a new technology is introduced into an organization, along with certain practices, certain behavioral changes that the technology is meant to, to, to bring about, uh, some tensions are likely to arise to the extent that this technology fits or doesn't fit a particular organizational feature. And, and uh, the three most important uh, uh, tensions that may arise are related to one technical fit, relatively straightforward, whenever a new technology is introduced in an organization, it relies on the presence of other complementary technologies, on the fact that people may possess the technological competencies. This is relatively banal, uh, almost obvious, but also political fit. Uh, this may be less obvious. When new technologies are introduced in an organization, they may alter internal uh, um, power positions, status hierarchies. Uh, the masters of the new technologies may increase their influence. And people may be partly replaced by these technologies and may therefore see their, their internal status and influence uh, uh, diminished. Uh, think about um, big data analytics and the rising influence of engineers on, and, and, and impact of engineers on internal decision making. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, managers, marketers that may, might have been used to make decisions based on their own intuitions, experience may see uh, may experience these technologies as threatening and unnecessary constraint uh, to, their, uh, to their activities. And finally, and this will be the topic of the day, uh, technologies come with fundamental assumptions, beliefs, and perhaps even values that are embodied in the technology and how it is supposed to change things in the organization, and they may clash with beliefs, assumptions, norms, values that characterize the organization that is implementing the technology. Um, so when it, when, when it comes to culture, intuitively, uh, we can define culture as uh, the way we do things around here. Uh, or if we want to be a little more sophisticated, uh, some routinized, habitual ways of doing things that uh, people have come to accept and, and, and to live by and to consider indeed a taken for granted natural way of approaching decisions, interactions, and their tasks on the workplace more generally. Now, when talking about culture, it's also important, oops, something happened here, that um, culture is not just about behavior, it's not just about routines. Um, it is a misconception to assume that if I am able to introduce rules, directions, incentive systems that change the way in which people behave, I have changed the culture. Cultures are remarkably elastic. Uh, people may temporarily adapt the way they behave to the constraints that they face, but once these constraints are relaxed, once this mandate is removed, coercion is released, uh, relaxed, then they may return to behave in the way that they used to. Uh, in this sense, Daniel Dennison has a, an, interesting, uh, uh, an interesting point when he, when he says, you know, culture is what people do when no one is looking. And I think this is important when talking about technologies, because technologies may introduce behavioral constraints, behavioral requirements, but in the end, uh, culture tend to be elastic and adaptable around these constraints that are initially introduced. Culture is also often defined as an iceberg, as an iceberg where behavior are really, as we said, only the most visible part and there's something that is less visible uh, deep underneath, a system of norms, beliefs, values, and according to Edgar Schein, who's perhaps the, has uh, developed the most influential theory of culture and organization, assumptions. Assumptions are fundamental beliefs about how the world works, about the appropriate way of approaching fundamental problems in organizations, how to make decisions, how to distribute power, tasks, how to separate 
uh, personal life and work and so on and so forth. And indeed, uh, when new technologies are introduced in organizations, um, the assumptions that they rest upon, that their functioning rests upon, may clash dramatically with uh, the assumptions that characterize an organization. And this is something that we noticed a few years ago when together with my former doctoral student Anna Canato and my friend Nelson Phillips, who's a professor at Imperial, we studied the implementation of Six Sigma at 3M back between 2002, 2007 at the time. Uh, 3M, I'm sure you all know 3M, post-it, uh, scotch tape are just uh, some of the hundreds of thousands of products they have developed in, 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 in many, many years. 3M is an epitome of creativity, innovation, entrepreneurial spirit, is about freedom, is about tolerance for mistakes. And when Six Sigma came, uh, a practice design, practice and a set of technologies designed to standardize, minimize error, reduce risk, make people controllable, accountable, that create a serious tension inside the organization. And in the beginning, people adapted, they complied, but eventually the organization rejected the culture, rejected the technology, the practice, and something stayed though, but by and large, the whole uh, idea of making 3M more controllable, more accountable was rejected. We will return to this at the end of the, of the, of the talk because this study revealed something interesting about the malleability of cultures to, uh, to change, and in particular to, new, to changes brought about by new practices or new technologies. Indeed, what the case of 3M suggested was that, uh, showed this point was that whenever a new practice or a new technology is adopted and is brought into an organization, whether it, like the, the outcome of this implementation will depend in part on the compatibility between the new way of doing things brought about by the, uh, by the, uh, by the technology, the practice, and the fundamental system of assumptions and values that characterizes the organization or the extent to which the culture itself is amenable to be modified, to be altered, to accommodate, uh, to accommodate new behavioral requirements. The problem with cultures is that they are inertial, that they are very difficult to change. Uh, people tend to resist change. Change, uh, Edgar Schein remind us, generates anxiety. People are afraid, anxious about change. They are afraid of being unable to properly perform in this new world that's characterized by this new, that, that revolves around this new technology. And they're afraid of being punished for this incompetence. They're afraid that by not being able to properly use or function with the new technology, they will lose uh, power status their uh, the, the, the deficiency or weaknesses will be exposed by the finer grain surveillance or by the finer grain or the more granular information that the technology produces. Uh, they may be afraid of losing discretion. They may even be afraid that, that's, uh, to, of losing their very sense of self uh, within an organization that may no longer value their skills and their and, uh, uh, and, and their personal uh, capabilities. And, and, and for all these reasons, people tend to, to, to resist changes that may, uh, that, that may threaten all these uh, aspects of their, of their workplace um, standing and, and activity. Uh, technologies more generally threaten cultures because offer new affordances. If culture is the way we do things around here, te new technologies offer new ways of doing things and ways that for which we may have no norms or assumptions. Uh, uh, and, and this is particularly a problem that I'm sure you know more about it than I do uh, because it happens at societal level too. Whenever you have new technologies like drones or genome sequences or the digitization of intellectual content, all of a sudden people are able to do things that we couldn't do before and for which we have no legal uh, provisions. We, we, we haven't figured out yet whether they are allowed or not. 
And so they may threaten other people's rights or freedom or economies or, or, or privacy. And similar things happen in organizations. Also in organizations, new technologies may challenge longstanding beliefs about the right way of doing things by proposing alternative ways as better and by doing so creating tensions and, and discomfort. And so the response in these cases may be partly reluctance to adopt the technologies in the first place, but then if the technology is actually forced on the organization by coercion, by a new uh, top management team, by external mandate, it may be openly opposed or it may embraced only tacitly, meaning people may ceremonially accept the new technology, but the technology may actually not exactly put to work the way it is intended to. There is only a symbolic compliance, but not a substantial one. Or there may be an open request for adapting the use of the new technology in order to make it compatible with current beliefs and values. What is important to keep in mind though is that in any case, whenever a new technology is introduced in an organization, culture will try to bend its, uh, its, its, its application, its enactment, its enforcement in a way that minimizes the misfit with the current, with the current uh, beliefs and values. Uh, Research in the past has tried to figure out whether there are characteristics of culture that make them more or less amenable to technological innovation. Much of this research has focused on knowledge management systems, information systems, and so they pointed to the importance of having an open culture that facilitates and encourages information flows, uh, flexible, fluid adaptation, uh, a culture that values collaboration, that trusts people. But actually, uh, if you go back to how we started and we look at the, at the variety of technologies that are now uh, being brought into the workplace, uh, it is reasonable to assume that the very same characteristics that may facilitate the adoption of information processing technologies may actually lead to resist the implementation of uh, surveillance technology, for instance. Uh, while there may be other values and assumptions that are entirely different and may be relevant, for instance, to the implementation of, um, of internal um, social media. Think about, for instance, the impact that may have the, the relative high or low power distance, the extent to which the organization uh, is hierarchical and vertical with, a, with, a, with a, uh, some... Uh, fundamental differences between the higher ups and the bottom of the organization and the difficulties that people at the bottom may experience in uh, transparently expressing their opinions and interacting in a social media that is open to everyone, even the top managers. Uh, and finally, we have to remember that not all values, not all assumptions are equally important for people. Some core values uh, matter to people in an organization more than others because they may be central to how they understand who we are as an organization, who we are as members of this organization. They've been around for a long time and they might also be celebrated as what makes them different from comparable competitors. And these, our study of 3M reveals, are far harder to change than other parts of culture that are more habitual and less deeply held uh, when it comes to bringing in technologies or practices that only partly fit. At 3M, people in the beginning were a little uncomfortable, but in the end, they accepted the idea that they had to uh, adapt the way they evaluated performance, they adapted the way they uh, propose new business, uh, new business uh, ventures. But when they realized that Six Sigma, in their words, was threatening what they thought were the pillars of the organization, the long-standing, deeply held values of creativity, autonomy, tolerance for mistakes, innovation, and and they and, and, and some informants told us like Six Sigma would be we wouldn't have a new post-it with Six Sigma. It, we wouldn't be as creative. And if Six Sigma is bad for post-it, it's bad for 3 So when they realized that it was threatening the very identity of the organization, Six Sigma was 
was eventually rejected. Revealing how culture may be more fruitfully seen not only as an iceberg, but actually as an onion, as a multi-layered, as a multi-layered uh, uh, system where you have an external repertoire of ideas, symbols, stories, narratives, rituals that people engage in or use flexibly, but they don't really constrain our, uh, our everyday action. Then there's a middle layer of behaviors that we engage in, in a relatively unconscious way, habitual, we do it because everybody does it, but we're not particularly invested into it. And we are open to consider uh, revisiting the way we do things if a technology comes up and it shows us that there are easier and better way to do things. And then in the end, there are core values. There are values that are very important to us. They're deeply, profoundly held. And, and the extent to which a new practice or technology comes to threaten this, that will really raise a fundamental resistance uh, because it would threaten the very foundation of our sense of self as individuals and as members of this organization. Uh, so the, the conclusions that we drew from these studies were that interestingly, uh, cultures seem to be at the same time more malleable and less malleable than people commonly assumed. Uh, more malleable in the sense that some assumptions, people were, were very happy to, willing at least, to revisit some of their assumptions while practicing this new uh, way of doing things. And this even lasted after they eventually rejected Six Sigma. But the elements of the new practice that they perceived as threatening, they were rejected and without any, uh, without any, uh, any regret, let's say. So this is interesting because it shows that some degree of coercion may actually induce cultural changes in a way that were not expected. And, 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 and to conclude, uh, I found it interesting that this seems to be what's happening right now with the COVID pandemic, uh, forcing people to work from home, even in organizations that have that traditionally refuse to consider this under the assumption that uh, collaboration would be hampered, that people would have, wouldn't have been as productive, they, they wouldn't have been able to control people. And now that forced to actually uh, uh, roll out smart working, remote working on a large scale by external conditions, many organizations are realizing that actually this is not so bad. We, we thought this wasn't acceptable, but kind of works. And so, if anything, this seems to be an interesting way in which uh, a combination of the new pandemic and the technologies that have, been, uh, that, that, that have been brought into the organization or diffused more into the organization by the new external conditions are changing the culture of some, of organ some organizations, at least. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, um, David, for this um, insightful talk. Um, I'll hand over to uh, Michael uh, now to uh, give us his comments. And I can see a lot of intersections between, between law uh, and organizational culture. And I, and I really hope that we will be able to construct this conversation here. So over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Iris. And thanks for organizing. Um, and thanks, David, for the really fascinating talk. I was scribbling notes throughout and hopefully can cover some interesting intersections here. Um, the two spaces of intersection that I want to highlight, at least between I think my work and your work, here, um, is uh, firstly around the role of platforms uh, in all of this, and secondly around uh, the interesting aspects that relate to automation, uh, both of which I've, I've studied. So firstly, when we think about the role of platforms in the deployment of new technologies into the workplace, uh, we can't really understate their importance sometimes. Um, uh, we're all here on Zoom today, and we're here on Zoom um, not because Zoom is uh, a product that had uh, the best salespeople, uh, not because it had the, uh, uh, you know, um, not because it was pre installed. I mean, UCL had to purchase a license for this. We're here for infrastructural reasons, largely. We're here because uh, the infrastructure that Zoom has uh, gained access to, to connect different parts of the world with each other using the fundamental infrastructure of the internet at a lower level is much more effective than its competitors. So we start to think about constraints and there become reasons technologically where 
companies are bound, not just because they want to, but they're bound to reasons outside of their control into choosing certain technologies. And we see that with many types of technology. Um, and the, there, are, the, there are some interesting scale effects here. The way that platforms, uh, whether it's Microsoft Word or, uh, or Google Docs or Zoom are developed these days uh, are through agile methodologies. Um, agile methodologies come from coding. Uh, many of you will remember when you used to go to a shop and buy software and it came in cling film, you shrink wrap, you know, and it would be a giant, giant box and you'd take it home and you'd install it on your computer and it would never change. Nowadays, software changes the entire time and it's very likely that David, Iris and I are running different versions of Zoom designed to show us slightly different features or experiment very slightly and telemetry data is gained about our behavior and this happens all the time. So those of you who use Teams find that it will randomly update and buttons will move around. Um, and and uh, Google, for example, run tens of thousands of experiments on their software at once using A-B testing. And websites do the same when you, you uh, see different interfaces. So this is interesting. Why is this interesting? Because it enables platforms to have a particular kind of surveillance view over the way their so software is being used. Uh, surveillance is part of design and it also becomes part of uh, analyzing, understanding the observable aspects of workplace culture in a way that uh, may not be visible to the companies themselves, uh, the companies that are, are procuring, the using the software. Um, telemetry is very powerful. Microsoft uh, have been uh, really pushed several times by regulators in Europe about illegal collecting of telemetry data that was not necessary for the functioning of the product because they want to get a, longer, a stronger view by understanding all workplaces at once. And there's some homogeneity there. And there's some isomorphism potentially as these workplaces uh, both become more like each other for many external reasons like professionalization, uh, but they also become like each other because we're stuck using certain tools such as breakout rooms in a particular format. There are some things we can and cannot do with Zoom breakout rooms. And it's very hard for companies to actually exercise any autonomy in these areas. So an example I liked over the pandemic that I think perhaps David has seen um, uh, concerns uh, Zoom. Uh, Japanese companies, and of course, Japanese companies, we know have very interesting and distinct organizational cultures uh, here in, in the world uh, totally, um, found it very difficult to use Zoom. Um, they found it difficult because Zoom did not have a function to make uh, the videos larger by seniority of person. Uh, and what they needed to do is they needed to have the big boss up in the top left and the big boss obviously had to be 20 times the size of anyone else and you know it has to scale down in that way and they even did you they did very convoluted things while getting dummy accounts to sort of pad it out but it doesn't work because the boxes move around and zoom was eventually forced to allow boxes to be rearranged they didn't give in completely but they gave in a little bit um, but there was that heavy pushback it took months and months and months of an interesting clash between an emerging digital organizational norm or, or a physical norm translating into a digital norm which platforms did not provide the affordances for so we see that and there's a limited amount of autonomy that companies can do because of course you know screw them they've got to just uh, take it or leave it in the end you know uh, you've got to use zoom because of the internet infrastructure benefits um, and japanese companies couldn't effectively talk across the world uh, if they weren't uh, but then we move on to workers and think about what autonomy the role of workers have. So um, uh, I really like David's slide about talking about different cultural interactions with technology. And I wanted to add another one that I think um, uh, maybe was, uh, it, it could have been captured in some of the different points, but I thought was missed out. Um, and it's around the generative nature of the technology platforms. So Jonathan Zittrain, who's a professor at Harvard Law School, uh, wrote about 12, 15 years ago, um, a really interesting article called The Generative Internet. And what Zittrain talks about here is that um, uh, the PC is a generative technology. It allows us to, uh, and it has done for decades, to build software on it. We can you know, create more things, it's permissionless. We don't have to uh, be constrained in this way. Uh, and the internet is, is perhaps even more generative um, because the architecture of the internet is such that the network is dumb and the endpoints are clever. The network just does what it's told, it transmits things. It's very simple, it stayed the same since the 1970s, whereas the things at the end have got cleverer. Uh, and this en enables you know, us to choose what goes on each end of the network and to generate new services and goods using, uh, using the network. However, the problem with a generative technology is effectively security. Um, by enabling generative technologies, it's very easy to, to leak data, to leak trade secrets, to create malware, and generative technologies can't be gatekept in the same way 
as um, other technologies. And we know from organizational culture inside companies, many of those are entwined with trade secrets and when, they, when they're required to keep them and when IP, it doesn't protect, for example, in many technology companies, IP does not protect uh, data. You can't have ownership of data. IP does not really protect algorithms. Software patents are very, very difficult, often impossible to get. It's a mix of de facto protection using enclosure, using trade secrets and organizational culture. So generative technologies are a threat there. Um, and, and workers, the generative technologies are also the source of innovation, innovation in terms of practices, as well as actual, um, you know, more digital or, or hardware software technologies. You know, uh, we are in CL using a webinar here that's not really been done before in the center, particularly. So, you know, it needed the ability for Iris to log in to set up a thing. It needed for us not to have to go to central UCL or higher to be able to do this. We didn't have to ask too much permission. Um, uh, so that's that enables those new practices. But uh, uh, that's also a, a serious uh, limitation because if we could just do this, we could start broadcasting anything. We could start inviting any kind of speakers. It might damage the reputation of the university. We might be leaking information. And there's that balance there. We see that balance in law with data protection. So data protection uh, is you know, the idea that we can uh, ask uh, for copies of our data. UCL do many human experiments or social science work, which creates personal data. And there's a tension here because UCL is the legal entity that wants to become liable for this. It doesn't want its each individual researchers to become financially liable. So it has to have some central view over what's going on. But equally, we know that researchers will keep their data on their own computer. They work with their own methodologies. We don't have some homogenizing central infrastructure. And so there's a tension here between where the liability falls um, and the generative nature of computing and enabling these experiments to happen versus the centralized nature that is uh, that UCL wishes to put in place to um, to secure its data, uh, and and so we see this tension, and we see it with surveillance and workplace surveillance too. Um, many of you who are watching will probably have a very very evil company machine, and you're sure that it's watching everything you're doing at any time. It's uh, it's it's locked down, it's monitored, it does strange things, it doesn't allow you to install stuff, um, and. Uh, companies sell these things to try and protect data breaches, among other reasons, to try and see if you're copying anything off your device. But this results in pervasive and uh, monitoring of all users and all workplace uh, happenings. All copying of files on the device can be monitored and logged. All use of websites can be monitored and logged. And we've seen the European Court of Human Rights has said this is really not on. You can't justify uh, workplace surveillance of that extreme degree to an unlimited amount just because you're in a private setting. Privacy also applies to say work emails. And so we see that interesting tension play out in, in law too. Um, and of course it will make people use those machines differently and it will make people interact with each other differently rather than if we could just whisper to each other in a staff room every so often uh, and it changes that culture. So that's what I wanted to say about platforms and the role of platforms and surveillance there. I want to do a briefly touch on another aspect, um, which I think is an interesting response potentially to David's discussion. And it's focusing closely, more closely on the role of automation. So automation is an interesting one. We see many anxieties around automation, um, uh, but automation interacts in interesting ways, the workplace culture. And this is something that I wrote my PhD around uh, looking at the deployment of machine learning in various public sector environments around the world and how it interacted with, with uh, law policy and culture uh, of those, um, of those uh, environments. So we see a few things. One interesting example uh, comes from Durham. In Durham, the Durham Constabulary, which is the name for the Durham Police Force, uh, they created a system called HART, and HART is designed to help, uh, be a decision support system for custody officers. When somebody has been arrested, uh, do they release them on bail or, or, or do they give them, um, uh, do they release them on bail or not? For, uh, the, the problem they have is that low risk offenders uh, should be released on bail very likely. Uh, high risk offenders, uh, uh, potentially not. Uh, but they were finding it difficult for, because custody officers were being very risk averse. Um, they didn't want to, uh, they didn't know what medium risk looked like effectively. And that was a cultural thing in a way, you know, this was a, a reflection on uncertainty, not feeling comfortable in making a judgment about who is high risk and who is medium risk. And so you would find that people were pushed into the higher risk category, but that doesn't have good outcomes for reoffending because uh, you know, you'd put, this might be putting someone in prison when they need to take their kid to school. And these are all important things that, that really found to help uh, with reducing reoffending. 
So they created a decision support system, which uh, while criticized for other areas, was very interestingly focused in um, dealing with those automation biases and helping people identify and have confidence in identifying medium risk areas. So as an interaction between cultural uh, parts of uncertainty, and of course, UCL has a strong history of studying culture and uncertainty, uh, particularly in, in the anthropology uh, department here at UCL. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and looking at that interaction. So designing automated systems with the culture of the environment in mind is really crucial and uh, doing that frontline work there uh, is important. Uh, it secondly interacts with uh, an area of the law. So I think looking at data protection once more, data protection has a provision around automated decision systems. Uh, and this has said since 1998 in the UK, that um, uh, effectively fully automated decisions are forbidden um, uh, and, uh, and they have to have a legal basis in order to remove that prohibition such as consent or such as requirement uh, in, a, in a, a legal instrument. Um, so companies have tried to find ways to say, oh, we're not making a fully automated decision. We're making a semi-automated one where a human is involved in reviewing it. We're not, the machine isn't making the final decision that's important and significant, it's the human. And regulatory guidance has struggled with this um, because uh, we know that uh, it, we can have tendencies, depending, as I said, with the heart system, to over or under rely on automated decisions, depending on the context. It's called automation bias. And so one of the tests that the European regulatory group, the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board, sets out uh, to, in determining whether a decision is fully automated or not is whether a worker will routinely apply the results of a machine or whether they have the authority and organizational competence to, to overturn it. So here we're thinking about um, you know, uh, a person who's maybe a very frontline worker at a call center who maybe is quite marginalized within a company, is quite precarious, maybe on a limited, a contract with limited security. How do you organizationally enable them to have the confidence to say, I can override this machine? I know I can. I am confident to do it. I'm not just going to say yes and rubber stamp the results. Because actually having that confidence is now a legal requirement in order to avoid these more stringent uh, parts of the regulation. And uh, so this is where we see data law and technology intersect with the need and a legal requirement for companies to revisit and analyze their organizational culture to make sure it's fit for purpose. Um, else you can have problematic automation at the end. Uh, and Mark Bovens has also studied screen level bureaucrats here and, the, and how managers do oversee people using technology at the front lines uh, and what they miss. And so it's very hard, I think, to generate that organizational culture remotely. And when we start looking at using things like Amazon Mechanical Turk, it becomes more difficult. Um, so I think those are really the points I wanted to, to raise in particular. Uh, I, I, and uh, there's yeah, others we can talk about maybe in discussions when we get some questions, but I definitely want to make sure we've got enough time for those. Um, so thank you. It was a really stimulating discussion, uh, David, and I think it will have stimulated the participants as well. And I hope we have um, some interesting questions coming in that, that uh, we can talk about. So thanks a lot. Right. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, we indeed do have a lot of questions and, and I, can, I can see, um, you know, where the conversations are starting to bridge. I mean, I, I can see organizational culture itself as, as kind of like a human defense barrier to, to perhaps, you know, very radical, very, very, very dramatic technological changes that make people uncomfortable. But similarly, I think law also plays that part in terms of a, of a, a very socially oriented human defense barrier, in a sense, in moderating the effects of uh, technological change because um, I mean if, if we if we allow you know innovations to to get on you know uh, um, a lot of innovations can push a lot of boundaries right so um, one big question that um, I'm getting uh, through um, the Q&A and the chat um, is about the impact of COVID I think a lot of people are very very um, anxious and, and concerned about um, what technological changes have been introduced um, in the wake of the COVID crisis uh, and how this pandemic may really permanently change uh, the way we live, the way we work and, and basically just you know, kind of opening up the floor to ask uh, uh, David as well as Michael to give us some of your personal thoughts and on um, just how permanent uh, you think some of these changes may be. Um, can I ask um, David first and then um, Michael? 
I, I would simply go back to the last thing that I that I mentioned in my in my talk. Uh, this pandemic is forcing organizations to change the way they do things and to uh, embrace ways of doing things, and in particular remote working, that a lot of organizations always mistrust it as. Uh, uh, as too risky, as getting in the way of socialization, as giving opportunities for workers, for employees to just shirk and do nothing, all the and, and and now most organizations have to do it, and by being forced to do it, now they are in a position that they can have a better idea of the actual implications. Their their reluctance that came from cultural assumptions about the impact of geographical distance uh, on the productivity of workers or the effectiveness of teamwork, now is put to test. And uh, I had friends, a friend of mine, head of security in a bank, said, I always, always refused to, to adopt smart working because uh, even when we, we were encouraged, I, I told my, my people once a month, no more than that. And now I have to admit that it works. So even when we are going back to be flexible about it, we will, uh, I will allow them to work from home at least uh, four days a week. And, and, and that's cultural change. Right, over to you, Michael. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think one thing that we're going to be very surprised around, I think, going forwards, this has been a, a radical and rapid upskilling of workers in technology um, of all types, actually, across, across all workplaces. Um, and where does this leave us? Well, we already have quite a, a, you know, a, a problem. I mean, for example, in academia, we have quite a problematic situation. I think, in a way, where uh, technology enables a lot of administrative roles to be placed on faculty members that maybe wouldn't have been before, when they could be more centralised. And we actually see some uh, interaction there between the affordances of platforms and um, and other technologies. We see a redistribution of uh, who is expected to carry out particular sets of work based on um, uh, based on uh, technologies enabling it. And we may see those uh, those perpetuate and carry on still. I think we may see also um, some uh, more uh, use of, of the technology such as collaborative documents um, and, uh, and, and technology such as these, as these have been introduced to people during uh, the pandemic and they have been, I, I work a lot with computer scientists. And so I've been in my work, you know, I haven't seen so much about uh, how organizational culture has been changed in other areas of say academia or, or practice because uh, I mostly might in technology policy even civil servants are using such technologies to some degree um, but I do think it's been uh, considerable and that in turn technologies like that also uh, have knock-on effects so uh, there's there's um, a colleague is currently doing a PhD in uh, in Aarhus University in Denmark around the um, surveillance effects of um, of uh, collaborative documents and how it changes the way that people write. And that's quite interesting, I think, because there's uh, there are aspects around seeing history or writing live, and seeing who contributed to what and who was pulling their weight or so on and attribution. And I think sometimes these uh, air technologies can have knock on effects too. Um, so I, I, I would think there's, there's some, there's probably gonna be some quite deep structural changes that result from that upskilling. Um, and I'm not quite sure what it's how it's going to play out yet, but um, uh, there is also an expectation now that such an upskilling uh, is possible. The downside of this, I think, is that we may also see a different attitude towards the importance of, of training, and I think that's um, that uh, that may um, that may also have some some uh, really tricky effects. We may also see. Uh, challenges that relate to the changing uh, of travel, uh, particularly I see, again, obviously thinking about academia, but thinking like colleagues in academia for whom going to a conference is actually a way to escape um, home responsibilities uh, and children and um, and so on, and, and uh, are put in a different mind space to do work. And so uh, we're going to see those changes around uh, the, the way in which entire fields operate and where decisions are made. 
and the fora in which they're made, which may have distributive consequences on different groups in society as well that we'd have to carefully consider. And I'm not sure that there's too many people taking stock right now of um, of that. And of course, taking stock of that can result in the need money to change. And that's not going to be something that's going to be flowing in great quantities for a while. Right, thank you very much, Michael. I have a couple of uh, questions here that, that deal broadly with the idea of organizational change. I think there is some appetite among the audience um, to, uh, to basically you know, ask for tips in terms of how do we produce change basically in an organization? I think, I think uh, one, one question is how do we change culture? Um, do you just simply wait for human beings to accept uh, the, the, the changes that need to be made or the changes that are thrust upon them? Um, and another question uh, is about whether or not, you know, going, going bottom up, kind of uh, uh, doing a lot of consultation, especially with employees, giving them some sense of ownership, uh, letting them have a degree of input, would that then lower resistance in order to bring about organizational change? I think both these questions probably have in their, in their orientation, the sense that um, the change is probably introduced by either external pressure or top-down pressure. And, and, and there is this appetite to know how this change might be more effectively route. Um, shall I hand over to David first to comment on that? I think that uh, usually I spend an hour talking about how to, uh, at least an hour talking about how to introduce cultural changes in organizations. Uh, a few thoughts. First of all, um, uh, cultures are more amenable to change when people are afraid or ashamed. Of doing things, if uh, the organization is at the risk of going bankrupt or is uh, or is being shamed by the media for the way it works. Um, one. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that it is important that, that regardless of the fact that fear and shame may make people more willing to consider cultural change, there will be an anxiety to handle there. So in this sense, uh, a gradual introduction of change where you create a climate of psychological safety, where people are able to express their concerns, where there is a, a collective uh, reflections on why we are changing the way we want to change and how can we do it in a way that minimizes its impact on, uh, uh, on people uh, along the lines that we discussed earlier is more likely to succeed. Um, there's also an alternative one, which is, again, the way we observe at, Six Sig at, at 3M, the way we are observing now is the more traumatic way, is just in enforcing change. But this will obviously, this may have a, 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 some medium term uh, impacts. It may come at a cost. It may come at the cost of people leaving. Uh, it may cost, uh, come at the cost of, of short term tensions in your organization. And in the end, the result is inherently unpredictable in the sense that it, all, uh, it is all based on the idea that if I uh, force you to behave in a certain way, sometime in the future, two, three years down the road, I relax this, uh, this coercion and then you naturally keep working the way you, you are now because that has been incorporated in the normal way you do things that as the 3M case showed us, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's inherently unpredictable the way in which people will, what people will embrace and what people will reject and not entirely predictable. Right, I wonder whether Michael has anything to add in terms of uh, your insights into, you know, kind of behavioral biases in relation to how people respond to technology, especially, you know, something that's new or radical. Thanks. Yeah, I obviously, I'm no, I'm no expert on on broader organisational change. That's that's why uh, David is here. But maybe I can say something uh, a little bit around um, some of the structures that um, uh, that uh, we see and, and emerge around technologies, uh, particularly around uh, compliance or understanding their secondary effects. I think this is um, uh, an interesting example. We've seen 
technologies that have been introduced into companies that have later been highlighted, particularly by civil society and academics, to have pretty harmful side effects, whether it's automated hiring tools or facial recognition or workplace surveillance. Uh, or, or actually, uh, yeah, frankly, I can, uh, I'm, I'm aware from many people as I Google that Google Meets blur your background more or less just blurs black people out and ignore it doesn't recognize them. And so we've seen like these, these issues that emerge there. And what, what are we seeing culturally change, culturally change around these and, and different workplace cultures? Well, I don't know what to what extent we can describe it as a culture, but um, when we look at Facebook in, in 2010, 29, uh, 2008 onwards, um, they were introducing a range of new products, but they weren't doing so with multidisciplinary teams from the beginning. The culture was really the engineers are making decisions, the value laden decisions, but also um, uh, they were the kind they were the kind of authoritative figures in this uh, in this process. And uh, legal experts or um, others would really have to mop up the problems afterwards. And we actually saw that lead to say Cambridge Analytica and many other problems. You can trace this somewhat back from there being a lack of engagement around side effects or with social scientists to begin with. Comparatively, Google has had many fewer of those kind of scandals, uh, but Google has interestingly always had an interdisciplinary culture around products from a very early stage where they've taken social scientists and lawyers alongside their products from the beginning. Uh, and um, uh, from what I understand from discussions uh, with people in both companies, um, the, the kind of authority of engineers in that way, was it was treated differently. Um, and so that was there's some interesting examples around that, but I think we also see the role of scandals and uh, and and uh, news coverage in changing what is an accepted structure, having companies look at each other's uh, culture or structure and maybe start to um, treat different sources of expertise differently within that process. But I think that can be a very slow process, particularly because of the culture's design to prevent trade secrets from leaking. The dialogue between these companies internally uh, is not always so great by design. Um, uh, so I think that's just a, a, a side point I'd say around uh, around some of the, the changes and, and challenges that can come with new technologies. Right, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think in view of time, um, I will field a final question uh, for David. I think I think David has received uh, really quite a number of questions, including uh, from Ruth Steinholz, uh, who's very interested in continuing the conversation with you about organizational elasticity. And I'll, I'll probably leave her to, to you know, get in touch with you. But there is a question for, for David uh, from someone who's been following your work for a long time. And, and the question is about whether your thinking has evolved since your excellent 2000 2006 paper on responding to organizational identity threats, specifically in relation to the importance of lift values in driving change in an organization. Um, hopefully you can uh, give a short comment on that. Thank you. Well, it, it has evolved in a sense that it has complexified. I think that in, in some ways, uh, the, the Bang & Olufsen study and the 3M study were complementary in a way that allowed us to to look at the relationship between identity and culture in, uh, uh, in, in different ways. Uh, and in the case of Bang & Olufsen, the fundamental issue was that they, they felt they needed to change, but at the same time, they had a very strong identity that, that was deeply grounded in their cultural heritage that, that circumscribed the changes that they could even conceive. Uh, and, and at Bang & Olufsen, uh, Anders Knudsen was a son of the house, was somebody that had lived and breathed Bang & Olufsen and its values for 30, 20 years before becoming CEO. 3M was a different story. 3M was Jim McNerney coming from General Electric, arriving there and saying, I'm gonna change your DNA. First thing he declared. So there was clearly an intent to change the identity, the, the lived values of the organization there, but there was no explicit uh, like a, a articulation or, of that, apart from this general statement made in the beginning. Uh, the, 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 at 3M, the changes that were brought about by this new practice, this new technology, this new bundle, uh, were threatening the lived values. And that's where resistance increased to the point that at some point McNerney 
went to Boeing, but it wasn't replaced with somebody that continued the, the, the push towards Six Sigma. He was replaced by somebody that recognized that the threat was there and was not something that the organization wanted to to put. I think it was interesting. One of the informants uh, after McNerney left said, uh, we have to recognize that Six Sigma changed the culture, but fortunately it didn't change the values. And we found it very insightful in terms of this distinction between lived values and a whole range of behaviors that we engage in just because we are used to, but that they are not really a reflection of the core values. I don't know if that answers the question. But. Right, thank you very much, David. I think to do justice to our audience, I'll just mention a couple of comments. I, I think they, they probably are more like like comments. And and if um if we get on, you know, with uh, um you, taking this topic further, we'll probably uh, uh, you know take another hour. But uh, one 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 comment uh, by John Meyer, who is a, a member of the advisory board at the center, um, is is um, as follows. He says to make change as opposed to just changing seems to me to require either some authentic contract or understanding of need or an obligating power, probably change uh, to, to be used to rely on the letter. Uh, and today maybe maybe the, the former. So I, I, I thought that this is this is interesting uh, in, in the sense that you know it has, has to be kind of very strong bottom up demand or possibly you know some, something that's coercive in, in nature in order to initiate change. Um, and and may, may, maybe I, I think change would come from many different you know uh, quarters and, and, and factors and, and, and David has, has touched on uh, many of that. Um, and another point by uh, Ruth um, is, um, is that um, uh, in terms of uh, the post COVID sort of considerations, a lot of people have found certain benefits and pros in the way uh, that, um, that, that, you know, work uh, and workplace uh, relations have changed. They may actually like remote working and may like a more sustained uh, form of remote working going to the future. And there might be the question of just how uh, to bring that to, to, to bear upon on uh, people who are managing structures and in positions of authority. Right, um, just wondering whether my speakers have any concluding thoughts um, before we call this session to a close. Um, David or Michael? No, I just wanted to thank you for the invita invitation. It was really uh, stimulating, insightful uh, to, to try to reflect more uh, in uh, more depth on the relationship between culture and technology. And um, uh, I think it, 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 time will tell, but it might have been a generative moment for me uh, at this point of my trajectory. So thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, Michael, any, any final thoughts? No, no, nothing else to say. I think it's been a great discussion and thanks uh, to everyone for bringing it together. Right, thank you. Uh, it remains for me to thank uh, David and, and Michael again for accepting this invitation to anchor this lunchtime seminar. Uh, and we hope this has been food for thought for everyone who signed in uh, and, and uh, enjoyed this. Um, please do feel free uh, to email us or to keep in touch with us if you have further things to discuss or questions or comments. We very much welcome that. Um, and so um, with uh, gratitude uh, to my panelists, uh, David and Michael, and to uh, you, the audience who have been here with us uh, this afternoon, thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you uh, at uh, our future events at the Centre for Ethics and Law. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>